All right, there's some of the morning to you. We're still here back at 14 and 15. 15.1, what are the major sources of energy that we use? And 15.2, what are the advantages and disadvantages of oil? All right, I can keep that one up the whole time because that one's very difficult. So I'm going back to boring polar voice. Here we go. Boom, energy use, world energy use from non-renewable resources, 82%. 82%, yo. 76% is from fossil fuels, 6% is from nuclear. Here's the thing that people do uh, commonly, is they take nuclear, and for some reason, because it's uh, it doesn't produce air pollution when in operation, they think that it's a renewable energy, but because we are taking uranium, consuming it, and it is you know, not consumable again when we are done, it is a non-renewable resource. Got it? Boom, coo coo ka -choo. We got oil, natural gas, coal, and nuclear power, man. Moving on. U.S. versus the world energy consumption. Okay, here's the world. Is the United States. So if you look, the world as a whole, 82% comes from non-renewable and 18% comes from renewable. Nuclear power providing 6, natural gas 21, coal 22, oil 33, biomass 11. Now we come over here to the United States, 93%, 11% higher than the world's averages come from non-renewable and only 7% comes from renewable. Um, let's see here. So 8%, that's what that says is, is uh, nuclear power. So we actually are getting more from nuclear power than from renewables. So this is a small market and has lots of room to grow. 39% um, comes from uh, oil. This number will be dropping dramatically as this one skyrockets due to um, hydrologic fracking, which we will discuss a little bit, I think, in this unit. Um, so yeah, there's that in a nutshell. Awesome. Petroleum and crude oil. Yes. So our conventional oil that we get, that we think of, that we pump out, black gold, a lot of stuff, Texas tea, all right, that is from the decay of dead organisms millions of years ago, three to 400 million years ago. These things were living and they died and they pile up, they pile up and they get covered in sand and silt and they continue to decay very, very slowly over millions of years and they form the oil that we are now dependent upon today, okay? Um, what do I want to say about that? Oh yeah, a little side note here. So, oil forms under the ocean. Coal forms on land, okay? Oil, ocean, O and O. Coal, crust, that's how I'll think of it, right? Coal is on land under the crust. Coal crust, oil ocean. Now, if we go somewhere that is dry land today, where we are pumping oil out of the ground, like in Texas, in part of the Midwest, where they pump oil out, what does that tell you about that part of the world, part of the United States at some point in the Earth's past? It was covered in ocean, very good. And there are parts of the ocean that have coal belts in them, which tells us what? That that part of the ocean used to be above ground, huh? See, that's crazy. So think about the Middle East, full of oil, right? And we know that that part of the Middle East used to be covered in ocean. Refining. Refining is kind of like distilling, if you will, right? You boil something right, until it becomes a, a vapor, and then you condense it off. We do the same thing with crude oil. And we, we used to actually, when we first started using oil, get the gas out of it, and then get rid of the other stuff because we didn't have a use for it. So we have this industry basically has come up with uses for all of these other products in crude oil so that they had something else to sell because they had all this other material. What were they gonna do with it? Well, let's make it into other products. So these other products have become asphalt, grease, and wax. There's this uh, naphtha, uh, which is a solvent, it says. Diesel oil, heating oil, aviation fuel, gasoline, and gases. All right, so the stuff that is at the top, that boils off the quickest. And the stuff at the bottom, like asphalt, thick, really thick, right? That stuff has the highest boiling point and is the, the last stuff that's left after we're boiling the crude. Oil consumption has been rising since 1915 is now the single largest source of commercial energy in the world. OPEC, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Know what that means, know those letters. Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, there's 13 total. You don't need to know all 13, but you need to know some of them. So we put the, the top ones here that you would be, A, most likely to remember, and B, tend to be the top producers. 
Iran, you're familiar, Iran and Iraq, Saudi Arabia, you're familiar with these because you hear about them all the time in the world crises that are going over there in the Middle East. Um, United Arab Emirates, okay, so this is the area where Dubai is in, one of the wealthiest areas in the, uh, the world. They have per capita more billionaires than anywhere else on the planet. And Venezuela, okay. So, this one is one of the only, is the only one listed right here that is not in the uh, Middle East, all right? So they control 60% of the world's oil reserves. OPEC earned $982 billion in 2012. It's almost a trillion. And here you can see that, you know, here's uh, somebody who's supposed to represent an OPEC member, and he's holding the gas, the gasoline, and that's the United States and the other developed countries in their hands saying, yeah, we've got you guys. And basically that is true, which is why there's such a huge movement to become energy independent so we can get off of um, our energy needs from uh, other organization or other countries that we feel like are tied to terrorist activities, but yet we still have to pay them money because we need their oil, so it's not a good thing to be in. Who has the world's most conventional oil? I believe in your books it has Saudi Arabia as number one. However, according to last year's proven reserves that were published, Venezuela is now number one. Canada is number three, and believe it or not, we get most of our oil and natural gas that we import from Canada. Mm, very nice. Uh, U.S. is number 14. Who owns conventional oil supplies? Uh, governments do. And what I mean by that is these countries, like the OPEC nations, they own 75% of the oil. Okay, and it used to not be so. Okay, uh, private companies control 25%. They used to control more because a lot of these companies are own, you know, British Petroleum (BP). Um, a lot of these countries in the Middle East used to be part of the British Empire. So they were owned by um, these British companies. But now, as the world, you know, the globe has changed, and now these countries were broken, uh, these, the empire lost some of its empire, the British Empire, after World War II, and they became their own countries, then they have gotten more control. So essentially what's going on is the, the influence on price from these private companies that you, it used to be great, is now starting to wane. The influence on price from the governments, so especially those OPEC nations, used to be small, is now increasing. Increasing oil prices. Weak uh, world peak production leveled off in 2005. Production exceeds new discoveries. They say we have roughly 70 years of conventional oil left before it, we reach um, is it, uh, economic depletion. From 2005 to 2008, oil prices rose from $50 a barrel to $140 a barrel. Um, last year, almost exactly on this date, February 3rd, 2014, it was um, $97.49 uh, on this uh, West Texas Intermediate Trading uh, line for oil. However, that hasn't changed. I don't know if you've noticed, but gas prices have come down tremendously. So right now, to that slide. So the WTI index is $42. And the Brent crude index, which was last year 106, is now 48. So why has it come down so much? And a lot of it has to do with the quantity of natural gas that we are pumping out of the United States because of hydrologic fracking. Okay, We have um, flooded the market with another form of uh, fossil fuel, which uh, which disrupts all fuel markets out there. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. Another reason, which has been speculated um, on NPR, is that Saudi Arabia, which usually in the past, when the prices uh, start to come down like this, they will level off their production to go ahead and, and you know. You drop supply, it raises the price, right? But they haven't right now. And a lot of and people are basically trying to figure out why has Saudi Arabia not jumped in to adjust this? Because they make their money off of oil, so they want to keep the oil prices high. And it's thought that it could be for one of two reasons. One, they want to shut down some of these fracking companies in the United States so they, can, they stop flooding the market. And or um, they want to drive the price of oil so low that some of these countries 
that are funding themselves in their terrorist activities with this, uh, the sale of oil, um, that, that they can no longer make profits off of their oil and therefore could slow down some of their terrorist activity. So, we're not really sure. But in the meantime, you are the beneficiary um, because gasoline is uh, low right now, it's cheap. However, it's not going to stay like that forever. You paid four dollars a gallon for it before, they know you can stomach it, and it will be back there again. So enjoy it now because it's not going to stay here forever. Domestic energy. 25% of domestic oil and 20% of natural gas. Uh, we get offshore drilling in the Gulf. 17% of oil and gas comes from North Alaska. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Keystone Pipeline next class. Uh, domestic cost per barrel. What's what the cost today? I don't have that pulled up. I wish I did. Let's see if it comes up. No, it won't open up. Oh, well. Um, U.S. used to import 60% of its oil today. It imports only 40%. One quarter of oil imports come from a terror supporting country. All right, that goes back into why we want to become more domestically efficient. So the huge push has been for hydrologic fracking. Advantages of conventional oil. This is the green, I'm sorry, the green, the, the black stuff that flows out, right, that you think of when you think oil. It's relatively cheap um, with subsidies from the government. It's easy to transport. We've been transporting it for years. We know how to do it. Um, where it's just part of, of our infrastructure right now, so very simple, and it's very concentrated as far as energy source goes, so um, that's great. Disadvantages, it's a hydrocarbon, so when you burn it, it releases carbon dioxide as well as uh, carbon monoxide and a host of other things that will wait to air pollution unit to get into. Um, water pollution, think about the BP oil spill, the Exxon Valdez, the runoff from land, which the majority of oil that gets into the ocean comes from runoff from land. Artificially low prices encourages waste, discourages search for other um, sources of energy. So if we can get rid of the subsidies from the government for conventional oil, then we could hopefully um, find in new ways of producing our energy. Uh, it's not renewable. We have to find a substitute within 50 years. Uh, the new number I've seen is about 70. So anywhere from 50 to 100 is a good estimate. And if you had to write something about that in an FRQ, I would use the range 50 to 100 years because we've seen both. I've seen both often, and it's, I think both of them are in the textbook. Oil sands and tar sands, and this is what you, th you hear about when um, you hear about the Keystone Pipeline, the tar sands up in British Columbia. So we've got clay, sand, water, and this stuff. And this is what we're after right here, the bitumen. And what you guys have to know when you talk about oil sands and tar sands is that this is the source of bitumen. Bitumen is the fuel that we're after when we're going after oil sands and tar sands. It's a thick, heavy oil, high in sulfur, so it's a very low quality oil. Um, it requires lots and lots of processing because you can't have all the sulfur in your fuel right, and then burn it. Um, there's a new mandate that came out, I think, in 2004 that required all diesel fuels had to um, have a certain sulfur content, right? Because it used to, whatever sulfur content was in the diesel, no big deal. Then they realized that that comes back to us as sulfuric acid in the rain. So we should really reduce the sulfur content. So bitumen requires lots and lots of processing to remove that sulfur. The reserves in Canada and Venezuela total more than Saudi Arabia has in conventional oil, which is crazy. However, good for us, Alaska has the largest reserves. Three quarter of all of the world's oil sands are in Alaska. So that's great for us, right? But again, very dirty fuel requires lots and lots of processing to make uh, usable. Processing the oil sands. It exists, remember, as clay and sand, right? So it's not like we're drilling and sucking it up with a pipe. It requires surface mining and more like strip mining, right, than like the big bowls that we would do with coal. Um, so uh, strip mining, we're taking down, not going very deep, and we're taking off the surface in a wide area. So we have to clear cut forests, drain wetlands, divert rivers to get to the areas that we want. Um, massive shovels cut craters into the earth. So for this, you'd be thinking about the uh, weathering uh, and uh, erosion, surface runoff, pollution of the nearby waterways. So four tons of earth create one ton of bitumen. Creates three times more CO2 per barrel than conventional oil does. And 
Whenever we extract energy, it takes energy to extract it. Kind of like the old adage, it takes money to make money, same thing, right? However, with, by, with oil sands to get at this bitumen, it takes 0.7 barrels of oil to generate one barrel of oil. So our net energy is only 0.3, which is not that much. It's a little bit, not that much. Oil shale, this is another type, right? So it's shale rock. When you break it open, see how it's very dark in there? It's because it's filled with an oil substance. And there's one of these um, shale rocks on fire. And what we're after with oil shale is kerogen. So that's the specific name of this oil product that we were after in oil shale. Now remember, with the tar and oil sands, it was bitumen. With oil shale, it's kerogen. So you crush the rock and you heat it up and it flows out of those pore spaces. Um, let's see, it contains enough to meet uh, U.S demand of, of oil for 110 years. That's how much we have here in the United States. Uh, the net energy is even less than oil sands, and we need much um, more technological improvements to make this viable. So right now, this is something that they have got on the table, but they're not really after and or extracting. They know it's there, trying to improve the technology before they go after it. Pause it, take a look at these oil sands and oil shale advantages and disadvantages. Fracking. Last slide, yes. So you guys are going to start watching a video next week um, called Gaslands, um, the second one, Gaslands 2, and it's about hydrologic fracking. So here are the benefits of it, because one thing we always have to keep in mind is we live in homes, we drive cars, we turn on lights, it all takes energy, it all takes resources. It all drives the economy, right? So we always end up in this rock and a hard place. We need the environment to survive think ecosystem services, but we need money to live in our civilization and societies, right? Fracking um, has helped the economy tremendously and has also uh, been causing environmental degradation. So it's water mixed with sand and chemicals. How many chemicals? Roughly 596 chemicals. Now, if you remember the Clean Water Act, all right, we need, these companies are supposed to um, they have permits to do any type of dumping into waterways. And they have to uh, disclose any chemicals that are being dumped and what they are. Now there was a loophole, which the movie talks about, that was given out and signed in 2006 by Congress that allowed these companies who are fracking to use these 596 chemicals and not disclose what a single one of them was. Um, they mix them with water, which means once they're mixed and they dissolve into the water, we cannot just we can't get them out. We can't filter them out, and no one's going to go after and individually remove 596 chemicals um, from this water. So once it's in there, it's in our water. Okay, um, we inject this water at high pressure into small fractures in the earth, which fracture causes breaks and cracks in the crust, and the natural gas escapes through these cracks to a pipeline that then takes it up uh, towards the surface. So pros, economic benefit, able to extract hydrocarbons that were unrecoverable with previous technology. Cons, groundwater contamination, depletion of fresh water. It takes, for every time they frack a well, it takes millions and millions of gallons to do it. We're already water poor. It takes millions and millions of gallons. Um, and they've been linking it to increased earthquake activity. So that's this one in a nutshell. I'll be back. I know you're looking forward to more. This is Mr. Pooler signing off.